Best ever listeners, how you doing? Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Joe Fairless. This is the world's longest running daily real estate investing podcast where we only talk about the best advice ever. We don't get into any of that fluffy stuff. And this is follow along Friday and uh, looking forward to our conversation today. Actually, uh, so Theo is still out. He will be back shortly. But today we've got Ellie Perlman, one of my friends and also fellow multifamily investor who is joining us today. Uh, and we're going to talk shop about lessons we've learned recently. Actually, she's going to talk about some lessons she learned from a 100 unit acquisition they recently purchased in Jacksonville, Florida. And I'm going to answer a listener question about um, you know, what he's looking to do, uh, because I think it can, it can be applied to uh, other best ever listeners who have who are in a similar position. So first off, Ellie, hello, how you doing? Hey, Joe, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well and looking forward to uh, having this conversation with you and learning about what you learned with your the hundred units uh, that you all recently purchased in Jacksonville. A little bit about Ellie, just so everyone can get some context. And um, Ellie's been on the show before as a best ever guest, um, but just as a refresher. She's the founder of Blue Lake Capital. She buys multifamily. She's a multifamily investor. Uh, her company, Blue Lake Capital, invests in DFW in Jacksonville currently. Uh, they have 600, or excuse me, $65 million um, worth of properties that they are on general partners on. That's about 530 units. And she is a fellow podcaster, a podcast called That Really Happened. And um, so with that being said, Ellie, let's go right into it. Um, what, are some, what are some things that you learned recently? Sure. So um, I'm going to take us back in time. Well, not that long ago. We we're talking about probably, you know, less than a month ago, we closed on a deal and I had some time to kind of let things, you know, sink and, and understand what I've learned. And I would like to share, you know, um, those insights because I think that can really benefit um, you know, passive investors and also syndicators. So yes, the first, please. so the first, um, you know, kind of piece of advice that I have from what I've learned is to get rid of um, a fixed mindset. And when I say that, I mean, we're so used to look at things in a certain way. We have certain investment criteria and we try to, you know, save time, but not looking at every deal that is out there in the market um, and, but sometimes we need to have more of a flexible mindset. Um, and what I mean by that is everyone loves value add deals. Everyone loves, you know, to, uh, purchase a, a property, do light, moderate renovation and, you know, increase rate of the, the rents. And that's how we make money for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I, my inclination was to rule out completely all the um, deals that didn't have any value add component on a surface. So mm -hmm. um, we, so actually that deal in Jacksonville, hundred percent of the units were already renovated. So if I had a fixed mindset, I would say, you know what, they're all renovated. The work has been done. So there's nothing for me to do here. This, it doesn't fit my, my, you know, uh, investment criteria doesn't fit the bucket of the, the stuff that I'm used to look at that I'm going to pass on it. And that would be a fixed mindset. And that was a great opportunity that I almost missed because, um, you need to kind of look at a little bit deeper, which brings me to also the second point of understanding the story behind every investment. Um, and by understanding the story, I actually realized that there's a huge value add, you know, component and, and a strategy that we can implement. It's just not in the way that we are used to look at it. So um, basically the story was that the owner was um, a, a developer mm -hmm. and he, for some reason, wanted to have all the units at 100% occupancy at all times. So he renovated all the units and the renovation is really nice. I walked I walked the properties, I walked the units, but he never raised rents. And so the property was trailing behind other comps, other properties by $200. The pro he didn't develop the property himself then. No, he didn't. Okay. Okay. He, he, he just, purchased it. He purchased it and renovated all of them. And renovated everything. Um, and so if I didn't, if I was, if I stayed in that fixed mindset, I wouldn't even look deeper into it and say, oh, 
wow, you know what? Someone actually did all the work for me <laughs> and never, you know, got and never got the benefit of it. So I can come in and do that. And the beauty in it is that he only actually started raising rents two, three months before he decided to put it in, in the market and sell it. To position it for sale, to say, hey, here, here's mm -hmm. what you can accomplish to prove the business plan, right? Exactly. And we're talking about close to $250. We're not talking about 50 Holy bucks. cow. Yes. So, um, and he... And he, he he's, not he's, not he's just renting them out. He was just renting them out. Um, but he wasn't doing anything in addition, like any additional work on the interior unit. Um, so he was, um, he renovated the units and he added nests, which, um, so just to renovate units, um, when he started raising rents, that was $200. And for each nest, that was an extra $50. And people, it's a great location. It's near the water. It's near the beach. You have a lot of beach goers and young people and they appreciate technology and willing to pay for it. And so if I had the fixed mindset, I would not look at this deal because I would say, hey, 100% renovated, there's no real value add there. But because I was, I, I was um, willing to look beyond that and uh, also look into the story and understand what's hap what is happening here and every deal has a story. You have to find what the story is and that's gonna help you understand if you really want the deal. So, so, so just, just so I'm understanding correctly, he renovated all of the units and mm -hmm. then three months ago, he started um, uh, getting the rent premiums even though on, on lease renewals, even though during that lease renewal on that turnover, he did not do an additional renovation. Is that exactly. Correct? Wow. Yes. Yeah. Because the renovations were pretty new. And it was $250. Yes. So we already have, we're already getting them. Oh. We just continued what he did. And, and that, that's a, if this is not a value add, then I don't know what, I mean, it's, it's great. It's just not the typical value add. Let's buy a property, let's renovate it, and then increase rents. And actually, I've had some pushback from some investors who said the renovation, uh, the, the value add component is very light. I'm looking for something a bit more you know, significant than that. And I said, this is the dream of every investor. You want to have someone else doing all the work for you because the renovations were completed not so long ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he basically did the work for us. And some, some of them understood it and said, oh, wow, you know what? This is a great opportunity. And some of it decided not to invest because they're used to have, they're used to see an, an investment that you actually put five, six, seven thousand $7,000 out of pocket to renovate each unit so you can justify those $150, $200 rent, you know, increases. They got and that fixed mindset. Yeah, yeah, I guess they do. I mean, we're so used to do something for so long that it's sometimes hard to look, you know, outside of the box and adjust yourself. And without understanding the story, yeah. I might have, you know, think the same. What, was this a marketed deal? Uh, no, it was off market. And how was, how did you come across it off market? Um, so I've partnered um, with a company that actually knew the broker okay. and so the broker had it. It was a pocket. The list. broker. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and when, when the broker uh, mentioned, when the broker said, Hey, I've got this deal. Did they mention, and by the way, the values already added. You just got to buy this puppy and then, um, uh, increase the rents on turnovers? Um, not at first, but at some point we understood that pretty quickly. Yeah. And the, I think not that the, the, the seller had a uh, sell remorse, but he actually admitted to the broker, I'm, I'm dumb. I should have done it, you know, a year ago when I just finished the renovations and he understood that he left a lot of money on the table. Yeah. Ah, that's, that's, you know what though? I bet he made a lot of money still. Uh, with, yeah. With the sale yeah. of the deals. Everybody, <laughs> everybody wins. Um, I, I hadn't heard of that size of property. How many, how, 100 unit? Yes. Okay. I hadn't heard of that size of property have that type of, of story before. So, um, but 
it's amazing that you know the, we're dealing with large numbers. Uh, right. You know, it's a hundred unit property, so you know it's a multi million dollar property. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it it just takes a handful of those if we come across a handful of those to make a huge financial difference to our investors and then also you know our team. So uh, thank you uh, for sharing that. And I think the the a component to that is being very knowledgeable about the market and the submarket because if you don't know the market and the submarket like the back of your hand then you're not going to see that there's some dramatic rent increases that can be achieved without doing any work on the in interior of the units uh, because you don't know the comps and you don't you don't really know that that's possible and someone who does come across that deal even though it's a pocket listing i it's likely that you all weren't the only ones that were seeing this pocket listing. Probably a handful of people mm -hmm. or groups were seeing the pocket listing. So it's right. likely that other groups are going to pick up on that. So it it's just shows the importance of you all knowing that market and the submarket and being able to see that opportunity and quickly jumping on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, without knowing the market, like the back of your hand and the immediate area surrounding the investment, um, you can't really know if, 100 or 150 dollars are reasonable or maybe you can get more and what's the level of renovation that is needed so we knew you know we drove the property we drove other properties nearby we knew how much they're charging and we knew that their interiors are are either at the same level or not as nice and they were charging more so we knew we have some room to push um, the unit so that was um, you know one kind of that was kind of one or two things that I've learned from this um, experience so get rid of the fixed mindset and understand the story behind the investment that's really going to help you um, understand if there's a real value um, in, in the investment um, and then the third point that I wanted to talk about is from the capital raising uh, standpoint so when we raised money for the deal I thought the, the value is so clear here, it's going to be very easy to raise money. Um, and it's not the hardest thing in the world, but it's, it's never the, the easiest thing. And I would say always raise more money than you think you need. So if you need to raise a million dollars, aim to raise 1.3 or 1.2, um, at least 20 to 25% more because people will surprise you. Investors that are ecstatic about an investment, even those who sign a PPM sometimes say, listen, I've, something happened, I can move forward. And you don't want to get to the point where, where you're about to close the deal um, in a, a week and you don't have all the equity already lined up. So always plan to um, raise more than you need because always expect surprises. That's all yeah. I can say. I, I, I have two comments to that I agree uh, happens with our deals too. Um, one, when just to clarify, when you say always raise more than you need, um, you're telling the individuals after you have what you need that you are on reserve and should something right. unexpected take place. So you're not actually um, bringing the backups in immediately. Oh, of course. You're just saying, hey, you're on reserve and should something change with the current investor. Um, so right. that's one thing just to, to clarify. Then two, I actually have a list uh, that we keep of decommitments. So investors who commit, but then later decommit uh, after they said they were going to commit and totally get it that, you know, things come up, um, you know, uh, it's crazy. I mean, it, I mean, I've, we've, we've done a decent amount of deals. So I, I've heard a lot of different circumstances for why they committed, then they're decommitting. But I have a rule where if someone does that three times, then I'm going to remove them from my list. So, you know, first time, hey, totally get it. Second time. I understand, you know, perhaps some circumstance took place twice, um, but then if they commit and then decommit a third time, then they're just not the right investor for us. Uh, so we actually have a running total of uh, our spreadsheet internally of people who have de committed and then decommitted. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good, you know, advice. And the way that I see it, I mean, we're partners. So I, I observe investors and I actually choose my investors and that's the beauty in what we do we get to choose who we want to work with and who we're partnering with. And that's definitely part of it. If I, I totally understand and life, you know, and things happen, um, 
but you're right if it happens more than once more than twice it's it's not really different than getting to business with any other um, you know partner and if something happens and they don't really um, if they don't do what they say they're gonna do once or twice you can't understand but three times or more it's it's a pattern so right. yep. choose yep. your partners wisely yep uh, agreed uh, well, thank you for that. That's a, that's some good stuff. I I'm grateful that you shared that story, and I'm I'm sure a lot of the best ever listeners are as well. Um, it, w- did you have more than three points, or did you have one, two, three points? Uh, no, that's what I have for today. Right, cool. <laughs> so I I got a message on LinkedIn from a best ever listener, and I'll I'll I won't read all of it, but uh, I'll I'll just read some of it, and I'll get to the the question. So he says, I'm grateful. I am so grateful I have your podcast as a resource to help me grow as an individual. Thank you. I would love uh, a way to a way to find a love to find a way to bring value to you. Um, I currently have two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars that I want to invest by the end of the year that will yield a high return enough for me to quit my job. I feel like I need fifty three hundred dollars a month, um, and I currently own four residential units, and I want to grow. I want to grow that to share ownership of 1,000 units of all, basically 1,000 units. And then uh, he says, I've got some sales experience, um, six years of sales experience, 100% commission. And uh, yeah, I've been doing it during some times when the market was terrible, but I was still able to thrive. And so he asks um, for any uh, recommendations for how to accomplish this goal. So if you got $300,000 and your goal is $5,300 a month, then that's going to be a 21% return. Uh, so, cause you know, $5,300 times 12 is $63,300. And then um, that math works out to 20%, 21% return. So that's a um, relatively high return um, to have in year one for anything. Uh, so what, what I, how I would approach this and, you know, I, I, I imagine there's a lot of best ever listeners out there who have, have some in their savings account or um, allocated to invest and are not 100% happy with their current position at their you know, W2 job. So you might be wondering, how do I approach transitioning out of what I'm doing. And by the way, he says he wants to transition out of what he's doing into real estate syndication or get more involved in real estate. So I imagine there's a lot of people in this situation, got a good job, got some money, want to get out of your good job and do uh, real estate full time um, or have real estate pay you to do other things that you would like to do with your time um, full time. And so there's two, two, two considerations. One is your time commitment uh, and then two is your risk risk tolerance, because um, there's basically uh, three scenarios to to consider. Um, but in those each of those three scenarios, you've got the two variables of time commitment and risk tolerance that you need to um, take a look at, uh, because that's going to influence which of the three scenarios you choose. So scenario one is you join an established company as a W-2 employee, but you get a a small equity stake uh, for the deals that they acquire. So you join uh, an Ashcroft Capital or a company that has half a billion dollars or more worth of properties, uh, and they can plug you in to a team, to to their team. And if you're valuable enough to that, to that team, then you, you could have, as part of your compensation, a small equity stake in the deals. Perhaps. Depends on the company. But uh, that would be, in my opinion, the uh, lowest risk um, on the scale. But um, you know, the time commitment, clearly, uh, you're going to have to uh, jump ship. Uh, and there's risk involved with... Um, going into a new company, but you will have a, you will have a, a, a salary. So I'd say there's um, lower risk because you have a salary, but then the time commitment, I mean, you're all in because you're, you're jumping ship into a new company. Um, the second is you join someone who has started, but isn't as established and you can get larger ownership in the deals. Uh, so 
you know, this person mentioned they're really good at sales for anyone who's looking to start in, you know, real estate syndication or real in just as a full-time real estate investor, you got to know what you're really good at. And then how do those skills apply towards what you're looking to do in real estate? So in this case, he is good at sales. So you could join a team um, that has started, let's say they've got, you know, between, um, you know, 50 to 200 or 50 to 500 million um, worth of assets under management and, or maybe even 15 to 500 million worth of assets under management. So they're, they're still growing and you can um, get a larger stake of ownership most likely, but there's more risk involved because, uh, well, they're not as established. And you may or may not be a W-2 employee, depending how they have things set up. You might be an independent contractor, so no health insurance, no, no benefits. Um, and you, know, you might need those things, which again, you have to look at the risk tolerance that you're, you're willing to um, take or your risk tolerance. And, and again, with the time commitment, well, this is jumping the ship, you're going all in. Um, now, the third option is uh, less risk tolerance and less of a time commitment, but it will take more time to achieve, and that's to start your own thing on the side. So you keep your full-time job, and you start partnering up with people, and then you build it on the side. And then when you've reached a critical mass or when you've reached a, a point where you're you you need to focus all your efforts on the apartment syndication or real estate business, then you go do that. But that takes longer. So there's no there's no one answer that I could give you um, or any best ever listener because I don't know your risk tolerance. I don't know the time commitment. I don't know your timeline. Um, well, in this case, this person said within a year. So you know perhaps you um, go either establish company, get a small equity stake if possible. Uh, or a, a startup um, or not as established company get a larger stake um, because the doing it on, on your own on the side thing is going to likely take more than a calendar year for you to feel comfortable leaving your job. Um, so those are some thoughts I would, I, I would, I would um, those are some things I would consider whenever you're approaching this because, you know, your $300,000 at, at 21%, it's going to get you your 5,300 a month, but uh yeah, it, it, it's that's likely not going to be an investment that um, uh, you'll be able to make um, for you know the first you know for a deal because I don't know any deals. Well, I do know non real estate deals that project that type of return, but the risk is tremendous. Um, so uh, I, I would take that two to three hundred k, and I would invest alongside. Um, the other investors in the deals that uh, I am a general partner on. So whichever, regardless of the option you select, join an established company, join a company that's you know, 15 to 500 million or start your own, um, take that two to 300 and invest alongside the investors that you're, you're working with. And uh, that will show line of interest. It will not reach the $5,300 goal. Most likely it won't reach that but it will, it will get you perhaps halfway there. And then um, you can use that track record and that experience um, regardless of one, two, three option that you selected and then grow it to the 5,300. Ellie, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, well, when I uh, wanted to get into real estate, I actually uh, did something I'm I don't recommend to do, uh, it, you know, a lot of people go to me and they, they ask the same thing. They say basically, how do I get started? Um, I decided to start right away and, and um, not continue in the path of a W-2. But I think you're right. I think actually I, I would, um, for most people, I would actually, I always say start, you know, don't quit your job. Start doing it on the side. Um, start getting involved and see if you even like it. Sometimes we have a vision um, of what we like and it's not really um, reality and, and visions or dreams are sometimes different. So it, it gives you the flexibility to try and see if you like it and try and see what you're good at and what angle you want to be in. If you want to be on the capital raising side, if you want to be on the acquisition side on the, or the asset management. So I always say find something you're, you're, you think you're good at and find a way to give, to bring value to another experienced investor, join them 
and get a taste and see what you like. So by the time you're completely transitioning from your W-2 job to full-time active investing, you, you have some experience, you've built some track record, and you know what you're going to do. And maybe you already met a partner or, or two that you can come kind of you know, form a company or a partnership. So that, that would be my advice. Sampling life experiences. I'm a big proponent of that. Ellie, how can the best ever listeners learn more about what you're doing? Um, they can definitely go to my website, um, ellieperlman.com, um, and all the information, or just Google my name, and they'll see all the information, um, how to listen to my podcast, and how to reach out to me. You um, can also uh, shoot me an email at ellie at ellieperlman.com. Uh, that's about it. Cool. Well, best ever listeners, enjoy our time, as always. Grateful that you're a listener, and um, looking forward to talking to you again tomorrow. Thanks.